welcome back to Turtlecast. I um, I just had an idea that popped in my head. I want to talk about this because I think it's a nice metaphor. Um, have you ever been to Princeton University? No, I have not. Okay, I think it was founded in like seventeen something, seventeen forties. I don't know something like that. I think this is this is a very interesting concept, and I think we can all think about this. Princeton, uh, the groundskeepers were like, you know, it look, it's nice down there, right? They try, you know, you got to uphold the image. Right. You know, so we have the walking paths got to look good. The plants and the shrubs got to be right. in the right place. So Princeton's laying all these walkways down and stuff like that for people to get from building to building across the campus. And they have this great, beautiful grass. And they're like, why are people still walking on the grass? We can't keep it nice. There's too much foot traffic on it. It's destroying the lawn. But we put all this stuff down. We want you to walk on these paths. But they're not doing it. So Princeton had an epiphany. They're like, okay. Clearly what we put down is not working. For the next couple months, we're going to let the students and people walk wherever they want to go, efficiently, from building to building. And that's where we're going to put our walking paths. And what happened? The rest of the grounds were completely preserved. And the paths that people naturally would walk is where they would put the walking path, where they would like concrete or brick or cobblestone, whatever it might have been. Tell me, what does that mean to you now in context? So Princeton comes in, right? centralized authority, and they said, this is where you're going to walk. And that doesn't work. But it didn't work. Right. And it's not efficient. So we went back to the people. And they're still trying to force people to be on that path. Right. So go ahead. Yeah, we go back to the people. Ooh, okay. We find out what naturally works for them. Yeah. By and observing the by data. Observing, yeah, by observing the data. And then um, we make our decisions uh, based off the most efficient um, and practical and prioritizing uh, humanity. Bang. And it works. It worked great. Yeah. And they're still using those paths. And people are still towing right where they need to go. Isn't that amazing? You know, you, you'll see that everywhere. It's like, you know, people will put down concrete paths, but I always take shortcuts. Mm-hmm. We all do. Let the people walk first, put the path second. You know, it's like let people define who they are first and then build the thing to them. Not let's, it's this, it's the Oprah Krusty in bed. Like you go into this, this innkeeper's place. Right. And he has a bed that's only one size. And if you don't fit the bed, then he cuts your legs off so you fit on the bed. That model doesn't work. But how, how, how many years have we done that? We've built something thought that it was genius and then we manipulate our market to um to cut the legs off to make them feel like they're fitting on the bed precisely correct all the time and so in turn what causes um this distrust among corporations because i i imagine right now if we went globally yeah and with tartle and we pulled people and said what is your trust in government what is your trust in corporations Ooh, that's juicy I guarantee you it'd be low. It'd absolutely and, and I be bet low. you corporations would be lower than governments, yeah. depending on what country it is. But um, this, this, I mean, you could see it with big tech right now. Look how many times they're having to go before Congress, you know, uh, Senate committees and stuff like that. Why? Why, why, are, why have all of a sudden is Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, Snapchat and all these attorneys and stuff, why are they up there? Is it because they didn't lobby enough? No, that's not it. There's a distrust with big tech right now. Yeah. And this distrust is them in exactly what you're saying. It's them. They decided the paths that we're going to walk. And they said, this is the model that you're going to fit in. They manipulated it to the point to where it's addictive. Mm -hmm. Um, Just like we talked about that the other day, just like foods. And now we're at a point where we're at a crossroads where people are becoming self-aware enough to understand that, no, this is a path that I want to take. It's like Patagonia. We bring them up all the time. Yeah. They they did the same thing. They said, "What do our customers want?" You know, with rock climbing, that's how Patagonia started off in seventies, right? Yeah, Wasn't he, it? It was just like Yvonne, a little brochure. Whatever his name is, yeah. It was like a little brochure people got, and then he's Dude, like, "Camp Four, Yosemite he, National Park." Well, you talked about the other day, and I was listening to a, a podcast on this. Um, he was talking about like how, how why are we just leaving everything in the rocks all the time? Mm-hmm. So he came up with that whole idea, yeah, of being able to remove your hardware. Yeah, so you got the trad climbing. But in the old days of climbing, like the earliest days when people were like climbing Yosemite, stuff like that, it was completely on equipment. 
Well, you also it penetrated actually, the rock. They would take hammers require, and stuff. Yeah. It didn't require much um, actual climbing like we have today. That was an right. evolution of it where you use your body weight and your hands and your strength. They were just using machinery the whole time. Right. So it was like bolt, 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 right. bolt. It was all this over bolting. And then you would put wedges in and it would crack the rock face. Yeah. You know, we've evolved much past that. So well, he invented the little things that spread out and go into yeah, the. Yeah, you get the cams that go on. Yeah, there. yeah. It's called trad climbing, traditional climbing. So you can only climb in spaces. And I think it's a more ethical approach. And that, that was his idea. And that's from that, from the 1970s on, this founder of Patagonia has approached that because he realized this is the path they want to take. A climber w doesn't want to destroy anything. I guarantee you 99.9% .9 of climbers are very pro environment. Oh yeah. Dude, Cause they're out in it all the time. Think about it. You're one with the rock and yes. you have a deep realization that you are fragile against mother nature. Mm -hmm. She is much bigger, much stronger. She's been around a lot longer. Yes. Okay. And it's not for us to take our artificial ideas of the world and apply it to the organic world. We need to take the organic and have that decide what our artificial looks like. Mm, I love that. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. And you know, and that metaphor needs to go for everything. So anyway, that's my riff on Princeton university. Shout out to them. Um, guys don't overbolt your roots on rock climbing. And if you haven't tried rock climbing, go out there and do it. Um, change your, perspective on reality and probably eradicate a little bit of fear you have i love it i love that perspective so if somebody wants to blaze their own path with data uh, blaze path blazing yeah how, how would they do that yeah if you want to uh, blaze your path take sovereign control over your information make sure you get financially compensated for it you sign up at turtle.co and then if you want that same respect to be bestowed upon other people that you're closest to get them to sign up also and there are benefits to getting your friends and family and acquaintances to sign up and blaze their own path. And then together, as a collective, we can come together, save our data, save our planet. Love it.